Today, just for the next couple of minutes, I want to try and address the question, how do you get to heaven? How do you get to heaven? In the Gospel of John, there are a few chapters that are known as the Upper Room Discourse. This discourse records, or these chapters in John, including chapter number 14, record the conversation Jesus has with his disciples at the end of the week, right before he's betrayed, falsely accused, and crucified. That week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion is referred to as the Passion Week. At the beginning of that week, Jesus makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey while the crowds throw their cloaks and palms on the ground. This is why we celebrate Palm Sunday. Jesus, along with all the Jews, were traveling to Jerusalem because this was the time where all of the Jews would go into Jerusalem proper to celebrate the Passover. If you recall, the Passover feast commemorates when God sent Moses to deliver Israel from slavery in Egypt. God sent ten plagues on the Egyptians, and the tenth plague was an angel was going to go through Egypt and kill all of the firstborn. Do you remember that plague? But God instructs Moses to tell the Israelites to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood and to do what with it? To put it on the the post, put it on the doorpost of their home. And by doing that, when the angel would come through, when he saw the blood, he would would pass over, pass over that house. So it was at the end of this week on Thursday, Jesus and his disciples were in an upper room preparing to eat, the Passover meal. And while they were in the upper room seated at the table, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, one of you is going to betray me. As you can imagine, the disciples begin asking one by one, they asked, is it me? Jesus, am I the one that's going to betray you? What's interesting to me about that, the disciples' response, is none of them pointed the finger at someone else. As much as they loved Jesus, they all felt like they could be the one to betray him. All of them questioned their faith and their commitment to Jesus at that moment. Their confidence was quickly turning to concern and even a sense of guilt. Jesus goes on to tell them that in a little while he was going to leave them. And of course, they were saying, and he said to them that where he was going, they couldn't go. Then Peter says to Jesus, well, well, well why can't I follow you? I'll, I'll lay down my life for you, Jesus. And Jesus says to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. I don't know about you, but if Christ said that to me, I would feel completely deflated. And I'm sure Peter must have felt that way, that to look in the eyes of Jesus and Jesus say that to him. All the disciples must have been looking at one another, wondering what was going to happen to them. They had left everything to follow Jesus and had spent the past three years with him. And now what would they do if Jesus all of a sudden left them, went somewhere where they couldn't go? They were full of confusion, questions, fear. And it's in that moment that Jesus says these words to them in John chapter number 14, starting at verse 1. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also 
in me. He told his disciples, and he's telling us today, when you're fearful or confused or your faith is being shaken, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe in me. It's in moments of uncertainty that we look to turn to something or someone to make sense of what we're going through or to try and find strength. And Jesus says the antidote for a troubled heart is to trust in him. Jesus is the anchor for all of life's storm. All of us are going to go through a storm. All of us are going to have our faith shaken. All of us are going to have our feet swept from underneath us. And Jesus says, believe in me. Trust in me. Anchor yourself in me. He goes on in verse number two. He says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? He goes on and says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may also, I'm in verse 3, so that you may also, right, be where I am. Notice Jesus doesn't say, don't let your hearts be troubled because I'm going to make this world a better place. Or because you won't have any more hardships or setbacks. Or because you're going to have all of the money that you've ever wanted and all of the health all of the days of your life. Or because all of your worries are going to disappear. Jesus says the hope for the troubled heart is in the promise of a place in his father's house. The hope for a troubled heart is a secure future in God, with God, and in eternity with God. When Jesus refers to his father's house, he's referring to heaven. He says, in my father's house are many rooms. And he's going there to prepare a place for those who have put their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. Heaven isn't for everyone. You must be born again. When Jesus says that he's going to prepare a place, that doesn't mean that Jesus is in heaven managing some some construction project. Remember when Jesus came to our home, when he came to earth, and there was no room for him? Well, he says, you don't have to worry about that in my father's house. He says, there's a room for whoever calls on the name of Jesus for the salvation of their souls. What Jesus was doing and and the Jewish audience that was listening, they would have quickly understand the or understood the analogy because Jesus was using marriage language. In the Jewish families in ancient times, most of the marriages were arranged. Two families would make an agreement for their son to marry the other family's daughter. And when the two of them reached the age to be married, the groom and his family would go to the bride's family to agree on a dowry, which was a price that had to be paid to marry the bride. They would perform a ceremony and the bride would be betrothed to the man, which was a binding agreement and could only be broken by divorce but they would not consummate the marriage. The man would then return home for a year during this time of being betrothed, this period of being betrothed, to build a room onto his father's house 
to make preparations that after the year period, he would go back during this betrothed period. When it ended, he would go back to get his bride and bring her back to his home. And meanwhile, during that year period, the bride would be preparing herself to leave to be with her husband. In Scripture, Jesus is referred to as the groom. And the church is referred to as the bride. And Jesus has gone to prepare a place for his bride, the church. And at the time that no one knows, he's going to return to bring her to his father's house. Right now, the church is in the betrothed period. And we need to be ready when Christ returns. How many of you know Jesus is coming back? I say Jesus is coming back. And you better be ready. Look at verse number four. Four through six, Jesus tells his disciples this. He says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas, who doubts everything, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Where was Jesus going? He was going to the cross. He was going to be the sacrificial lamb that would die for our sins. He was going to be buried and rise from the dead. And it is through his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension back into heaven that he becomes the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to heaven. The good news of the gospel is our salvation and home in heaven is not dependent on what we do for Jesus, but rather on what he did for us. You know how sometimes we want to puff our chest out? Well, man, I helped the Haitian guy this week, and I'm helping Jesus along, and I'm doing all the... No, 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 you don't get a feather in your cap doesn't get you any closer to heaven. You do that out of the same love that he shed in your heart. You ought to spread that love to others. But it didn't get, doesn't get us into heaven. It's only what Jesus has done for us, not what we have done for Jesus. Jesus has made the way for you and, and, and I to spend an eternity in heaven, but unfortunately, some people get stuck by the fact that Jesus is the way. They get stuck by the fact that Jesus is the truth. They, they get stuck by the fact that Jesus is the life. People are accepting of a way, a truth, a life. It's that little word they can't get past. The. People stumble over the exclusivity of salvation through faith alone, in Christ alone. And most people have a love-hate relationship with exclusivity. We love it when we're included in it. And we hate it when we're excluded by it. And when it comes to answering the question, how do you get to heaven? Our culture rejects the fact that there is just one way that leads to heaven. They believe the answer is, should be more inclusive. That it can't be that narrow, it can't be that myopic. 
They believe there isn't one true God, but rather there are many gods that you can choose from that will take you to heaven. They believe that there are many roads and they all lead to the same destination. The world rejects the idea of exclusivity when it comes to heaven because they believe in individual truth. They believe that everyone can determine what truth is and no one has to subscribe to just one truth. Can I tell you what the Bible says about that? It's a lie. It's a lie. There is only one true and living God, and his name is Jesus. He is the only God who left heaven and humbled himself and became a man and lived the life that we should have lived and then died the death that we should have died. The road to heaven is narrow. And the Bible says only a few will find it. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life that is eternal. I want to pause today because some of you may be coming to church, but you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Some of you have become religious, and you've developed these routines where you, you come to church, and some of you come for the 1030 service, some for the 11. And you feel like you're doing God a favor because you showed up. And so you go through your prayer seasons where sometimes you pray and sometimes you don't. You go through seasons where you sometimes read your Bible and sometimes you don't. You go through your seasons where sometimes you submit to the Spirit of God and then other times you're just doing your own thing. And for some of us, we've created our own religion. Where we no longer submit to God, God has to submit to us. And so we, we present one way here at the church. But man, if we took a peek behind the curtain on Tuesday and Wednesday or Friday night or Saturday night, and if we looked at where you gave your best energies and your best time and your best efforts, does your life say that Jesus is Lord? That he is the only way, the only truth, and the only life? Are you living for him? Because there's a, the way to heaven is a narrow road. And we try to use our own ingenuity and our own ideas to get to heaven. And it's only through Jesus Christ. I'm pausing here because during this Easter season, I want you to be honest with you. I want you to really look inside of your heart and ask yourself, is Jesus the way for me? Am I following after him with all of my heart and all of my mind and all of my soul? What is your, this is, I say this to my kids all the time in jest and a little serious. And my question to them always is, what is your life about? Because if it's not about the kingdom, you are wasting your time. What's your life about? What's your life mission? What are you living for? Who are you living for? It's interesting. We were at a birthday party last night, and this young lady uh, turned 50, and we were celebrating her, and, and uh, just a, a wonderful uh, occasion. And, and I've, I've been to parties 
um, especially when people reach certain milestones and they say things like, you know what, I've been living for, for my family, I've been living um, uh, to raise kids, and now, you know what, I'm just going to live for myself. And I was so blessed last night because her testimony is she's living for the Lord. That that's what her life is about. And that I don't outgrow living for the Lord. I don't get to a certain stage and I say, you know what? Bump the Lord. It's, I'm going for mine now. Some of us get to a place in our lives where we say, you know what? I'm just going for mine. I'm so glad that my Savior didn't go for his. But that he went for ours. And sometimes we get tired. We say, how long do I have to do this? How long do I have to hang in and just look at the cross? How long? The Bible says this life is like a vapor. You're here just for a moment. And it cannot compare to the future glory that God has prepared for us in Christ Jesus. So if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ by placing your faith in him for the forgiveness of your soul, your heart should be troubled. Your heart should be uneasy. Because without Jesus Christ, your life is heading for eternal damnation. And I know you may be here and maybe you're 16 or maybe you're 21 or maybe you're 35. Maybe you're in the prime of your life and you can never imagine there being an end. But all of us one day are going to have to see Jesus. And the question is, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready to see Jesus? The good news is Jesus has made the way for you. He's made the way for you to go into heaven by dying on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you put your faith in him, Today, he becomes your Passover lamb. The blood he shed on Calvary's cross will be applied to you. And you will receive eternal life. Jesus has secured a future for you in his father's house. And the way you can receive it is through faith alone, in Christ alone. Or maybe you're here today and you're already saved, but you're in the middle of a storm, or you feel like you're under attack, or your faith is being shaken and you're fearful. Take courage in the words of Christ today. And his words are simple. He simply says, just when you need something. She said, it's all right, Pastor. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. Without any music, I'm going to ask you to stand today. I'm going to ask you to stand today. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I don't want you to be distracted by anything. I want you to take a moment to search your soul and to search your heart and answer the question, am I on my way to heaven? Have I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? I'm not talking about you went somewhere and said some words talking about, are you living for the Lord Jesus? Are you seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness? 
Are you loving God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your being? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Are you willing to go and tell others about Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, the life? If you're here today and you're saying, you know what, Pastor, I'm not sure what road I'm on, but I want to make it sure today. I want to secure a place in God's house through putting my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Bible says, if you would confess with your mouth and believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Not because you just said the words, but because you made a commitment in your heart. So with every head bowed, Father, we thank you.